So this is the last lecture we're going to do on uh, query optimization. Um, and this is actually a very important one because you have to, the cost model is what you're going to use to figure out whether one plan is better than another. So the way to sort of think about how this one's going to relate to the last two lectures is that the previous two lectures were about doing the search or, and the transformations to find uh, different query plan alternatives for this, you know, different physical and logical query plans that are equivalent to the original plan you were given. Uh, and then the cost model is necessary to figure out whether one plan is better than another. And then you can choose that from, from all the different alternatives. So for today, we're going to first talk about um, how do you actually build a cost model? Um, what are the components you can use to, to approximate what the cost of running query is? And then we'll talk about how to actually do cost estimation based on this. Uh, and this is be tied into the, the paper that you guys read. And it showed that uh, if you get the selectivity estimates wrong when you do query planning, you get bad performance. Um, and then I'll finish up, as I promised last class, with a sort of small vignette of sort of tips that I've sort of accumulated over the years about how to uh, go about working on a large code base independently. And this will be important for you guys as you get started on project three. If you haven't started yet, you should start very soon. Um, about how you take an existing code base that you didn't write and may not be entirely documented uh, completely at, or at all. And uh, the student that wrote it, or the person that wrote it is dead or gone, right? So how do you actually go about you know, understanding the system? Or, uh, and then this will be important again when you go out into your, to your career, okay? All right, so as I said, the, the, the today's lecture is really about this idea of doing cost-based query planning. So at the very first lecture when we talked about query optimization, we talked about how in the very first systems, uh, Ingress and Oracle from the 1970s, these were based on doing static transformations or using heuristics to decide how to generate an optimized query plan. And as we said, for some simple things like doing predicate pushdown or selecting the right index for a, a you know, one table query, these, these are good enough, right? Uh, but when you want to start doing more complicated things, right, uh, n-way joins, uh, CTEs, window functions, all sorts of more advanced SQL things, then heuristics are not going to be sufficient because it's going to be really hard to come up with rules that you could execute and apply to transform a, a really complex query. And so the major contribution, one of the major contributions of the System R project was that they said that you'd want to use a cost-based uh, query optimizer that can then just enumerate a, or over a bunch of different alternatives for how to execute your query plan and then choose the best one based on this estimate. All right? So this is essentially what we're talking about today is how do you actually build that cost model and do that estimate. So the important thing to understand is that these estimates are going to be only meaningful or only make any sense to internally to the database system, right? Because they're not going to be tied to wall clock time or some, some, some real world metric, right? So you, that means you can't take the cost model uh, approximation for or estimate for MySQL and do some kind of comparison against the cost model estimation for, for Postgres. Completely different systems, going to use completely different metrics to, to make these estimations, right? So these only allow us to internally decide that one query is relatively better than, than another. And the other important thing to note also too is that everything we're talking about today here is independent of the search strategies that we talked about in the last two classes. So it doesn't matter whether you're doing a unified search or a stratified search, or you're going uh, top down or bottom up, uh, the cost models that we'll talk about today can be used in, in either one of them, okay? So the question is how are you actually gonna build a cost model? So there's essentially three, three different uh, components you could, you could include in it. So the first is, the most obvious one, is to estimate the physical costs of executing query. So what are the resources that the database system is going to use in order to execute the query, right? The number of CPU instructions or cycles, the amount of I.O. you're going to read and write, uh, whether you're going to have cache misses or not, how much DRAM you're going to use. Um, so all of these things are essentially what the system is going to do when it actually runs your query. So you would think that these would be, you know, a good way to estimate whether one query is going to be better than another. The problem is that these metrics, uh, with the exception of maybe uh, I.O., 
depend heavily on, on, on the hardware. And, many, and it also depends on what the you know, storage model you're using for the database system. So the most common one that people use in a disk-based system is disk I.O., which we'll see in a second. Right? When, when we took the introduction class, we talked about comparing join algorithms. And the way we estimated whether one was better than another is based on the amount of disk I.O. Uh, you, you would have to incur when you execute this. Um, for, but for other things like CPU cycles and cache misses, this is really hard to, to, to approximate because, again, this depends on what CPU you're actually using. And actually, even the case of disk I.O. depends on whether you're using a uh, you know, spitting disk hard drive or an SSD or the new non-volatile memory stuff. Right? This can change from one installation to the next. So this can, this can be difficult to get right. Uh, the next approach is to use the logical costs of executing the query. And so these would be things like the amount of data the operator is going to, uh, to, to spit out, right? the number of tuples the, the operator is going to emit that's going to go up into the, to the query plan. Um, and so in this case here, this is done at the logical level. So this is independent of the actual uh, algorithm you're using for the physical operator. So a logical cost, it doesn't matter whether you're using a hash join or a cert merge join or a nested loop join, the number of tuples you'll spit out for all three different algorithms will always be the same. Um, and so the way you need to make this work, though, is that you need to have a way to estimate based on the input you're given and whatever the predicates are in the, the query that, that apply to your operator, you need to use that to estimate how these things are going to, uh, how much data you're going to actually spit out. Which again, as we'll see as we go along, this is not always easy to do. And the last one is, uh, is important and it's tied to mostly uh, this one here. So this is not actually something you could use independently. Um, but this is just taking the algorithmic complexity or the computational complexity of what are the algorithm you're using for the particular operator? So this is where it matters whether you're using a hash join or an nested loop join or sort merge join. Right? Those, those different algorithms have different cost complexities uh, that can vary a lot. But the, the, this is sort of, like sort of the abstract or highest level way to consider this. Um, and you can sort of do like you know, big O analysis and to, to, or take the worst case analysis. But typically, you tie this into with, with this one here. So now you include the logical cost of how much data you think that one operator is going to spit out. And then you can then tie that with the algorithmic cost to say, all right, I have this much data coming into my hash join, or I have this much data coming into my sort merge join, and how to wait and use a way, use that to estimate uh, whether one choice is better than, than another. So as we'll see as we go along, I guess the spoiler is that the, the in-memory guys will mostly use this. The disk-based guys would mostly use uh, either the top two or a combination of, of all three. So in the case of a disk-based system, again, as, we, as, I, as I said in a, a few seconds ago, the, the primary cost or hardware resource they have to deal with is always going to be disk I.O., because right? that's going to be the dominating factor of executing the query, because the disk is simply just, just so slow. Um, and so in this environment, oftentimes you can just ignore the execution costs or the CPU overhead of executing an operator just because you know that if you ever have to go read anything from disk, that's super, super long, especially if it's a spinning disk hard drive. Um, and any system that's been built, uh, you know, actually, even the last, after the last five years, uh, you always have to consider the, the difference between sequential I.O. and random I.O. Uh, in a spinning disk hard drive, this matters a lot because the, as it spins around, if you can read, if you can plop the arm down and read a, a track, uh, continuously, then you're going to do much faster than if you have to, the arm has to jump around and do random I.O. So your cost model may consider that, all right, some algorithms can do sequential I.O., and that'll be better than doing in random I.O. And this has to be all, again, included in, in your cost model and understand how the data is actually laid out and what, it, what the operator is actually trying to do on it. Um, so disk I.O. is nice because in a, uh, in a database system, since we're not using MMAP, we're not relying on the, the operating system to manage our memory for us, we have complete control over this. So therefore, we know what's going to be in memory versus out of memory, at least have an approximation of how, how the buffer pool manager is going to work. Um, so we can include things like the replacement strategy and pinning and other things that, that would occur inside the system when we decide how data is moved in and out in our cost model, and then use that as a way to get more accurate estimation of what we think the query is going to do when it actually runs. So if you have a distributed database system, like in the case of MemSQL, for the paper you guys read the last class, uh, you can essentially just replace disk I.O. with network I.O., right? Because that's just as bad. 
And so in a distributed data systems, they have to figure out that they know how the data is placed across multiple machines and include that in its cost estimates. Um, and it's essentially more or less doing the same thing as you would with disk I.O. So one interesting thing to look at, uh, I always like to talk about in, when we talk about cost models is how Postgres does this. Um, the reason why I always use Postgres as an example because in my opinion, it is a almost like a it's a great example of a textbook implementation of a of a disk based database system. So you take any introduction database class, or you take any uh, database systems textbook, and how it's described in in the textbook is almost exactly how Postgres implements a lot of things. So their cost model is a combination of the CPU and I/O costs, and they're, it's sort of added together in in a, in a formula, and then these different elements will be weighted by these magic constants. Uh, that say how you know what the relative cost of one particular type of operation is versus another, right? Or you know one cost versus another, right? So for example, you you could say that, uh, or by default, it'll say that if you process a tuple that's in memory, that'll be 400x faster than reading the tuple from disk, and if you're doing sequential I/O, that'll be 4x faster than doing doing random I/O, right? And so these are just flags, these, these, these weighting factors here are just flags you can set in Postgres's config file uh, that when you boot it up, it will use these uh, when it does its estimations. And these are the defaults. And when you look at the Postgres manual, uh, you know, for all these different, different um, components, they talk about here again that the, they, they weight everything as based on the, the sequential scan cost. So sequential page cost is conventionally set to one, and then all other cost variables are are, are relative to that. And so they have this warning here, though, that says like the, the way these default parameters are set as, or is that they're basically trying to be a, a best case scenario of the average of what uh, cost of what they think hardware looks like. Right? So again, that means that every single database system, every single installation of Postgres, if you don't change this config file, they're assuming it has these uh, hardware constants or magic constants they use for its cost estimates. And, Depending on what your hardware looks like, it may not. These things actually may not be uh, correct. Right? If you have a really fast disk, like an like an NVM uh, drive, then weighting things uh, the, the the random I/O to be four x slower than sequential I/O may, may not be the right parameter. But this warning here is telling you that uh, changing these values can be really risky, and you may end up getting getting worse performance if you don't know what you're doing. So. This is what an open source system does. Uh, MySQL is a little bit less, less sophisticated, but at a high level, it's essentially doing the same thing. Uh, when you start looking at the commercial guys, this is where you see things get more, way more complex, right? Because at, at the big three vendors, you know, IBM, DB2, or IBM, Oracle, and Microsoft, they have a lots of money and they can pay lots of people to come up with really complex cost models. Yes? For Postgres, are there like benchmarks that would spit out what they think would be? based on your system that would be for that system? Right, so his question is, in the case of Postgres with these constants, um, do they run micro benchmarks when you boot up to try to figure out these things out? Postgres doesn't, DB2 does, and we'll see this in small base in, in, in a second, they do that as well. Um, so, per, so this is the DB2 cost model, and this is from a uh, presentation by Guy Lohman, um, the guy who invented Starburst um, that we talked about uh, uh, two classes ago um, from IBM. And so he lays out all the different things that IBM is going to include in their cost model to try to allow them to come up with more accurate estimations of what we, they think uh, query is going to do. So it shows you have to include things like what does the database actually look like. So this includes things like the statistics you have about tables and columns and indexes, as well as constraints you may have on attributes. Right, if you know that something can't be, you have a check clause that says something can't be greater than this or less than that, you can use that to, to estimate the cardinality or selectivity more accurately. Um, they're doing the thing that Matt asked about in the beginning is that you actually use some micro benchmarks when you boot the system up, basically just running like almost like BOGO MIPS in, in Linux where you just do some quick I.O. or compute you know, the, the, the million digit of pi and use that as an estimation of what you think the, the hardware is capable of doing when it actually executes queries, and you can use that uh, as a weighting factor in your, in your estimations. If you're doing a, um, you have a distributed deployment, you can do the same thing, do micro benchmarks over the network and see how fast that actually is. Um, you keep track of, again, these, are, these would be parameters you would set in the system about your, how much memory you have for your buffer pools, so the sort heaps, 
But actually, what is really interesting and a good example of what the commercial guys do that the open source guys can't do is that they actually have a dynamic uh, uh, component in their cost model that is based on what is queries are running at the moment you're trying to do this planning. So if they know that there is a bunch of queries running at the same time, then one particular plan might be more expensive than another plan because you end up having more contention with, uh, with other things running at the same time. As opposed to if you're running completely alone, then maybe you can be more aggressive with how much memory you're using or how much uh, disk you're using. Um, so when I say BOGO MIPS, does everyone know what I'm talking about or no? Raise your hand if you know what BOGO MIPS is. All right, very few. All right. So if you ever look in Linux, uh, if you, when you log into Linux, if you, if you look at like slash proc slash CPU info, they'll have all the information about your CPU, right? Tell you your cache sizes, what the frequency is, the clock speed. Um, you know, it'll tell you the vendor and the model. But then there'll be a little entry in there called BOGO MIPS, right? It stands for bogus, uh, you know, million instructions per second. And this is like a little micro benchmark that Linux runs when you boot the system just to see how fast they think your CPU is. Right? It's not a, a super accurate estimation, but it's good enough for what they need to do. And then they use that as to, as to help them make decisions about how they do scheduling or hand, do interrupt handlers. Right? So it gives you a quick and dirty way to say, here's what we think the, the hardware capabilities are for, for the CPU. So it's the same thing. It's a micro benchmark that they're doing to say what they think the hardware can do, uh, and they can use that to decide you know, what will happen when they actually execute the query. Yes. So this question is: Is there any substantial difference between what, what I'll call a micro benchmark and a, and a regular benchmark? So so there is there's no like exact scientific definition of a micro benchmark. I just mean like thing. So that, so they compute, you know, the million digit of pi. It's a little a little for loop that just does this. That's a micro benchmark. Running TPCC would be a full benchmark. Uh, so it just depends on slides. Yes, but it's but it's, again, it's it's not a it's not like a scientific. yeah it's not a scientific definition like oh clearly this is a micro benchmark right it's just something we say right um all right so again so again the main takeaway here is that the commercial guys uh, do way more sophisticated things than the open source guys. Uh, and again, the idea is that they, they, they want to try to have better, uh, better cost estimations, right? Um, I would say in general, the, the IBM guys have a lot more, there's a lot more academic papers or, or things in, in, the, in the research papers that are available uh, than the other two major, major database systems. So IBM is pretty open about what they do, Oracle and Microsoft less, uh, less so. Um, but I, I, you know, if IBM is doing this, then you know Oracle and you know IBM are doing, or uh, Microsoft are doing similar things. All right, so now we can talk about what we want to do in an in-memory database system. So again, as I said in the very beginning of this class, the major thing about in-memory database is that the disk is gone. So we don't need to measure disk I/O for our for our queries, and that's not because that's not something we have to, we, we we care about anymore. Um, but now the cost of execution is going to get shifted down or you know, more, be more fine grain. And now we have to consider uh, what's actually going on in the CPU. And now we have to also consider our memory access costs. Because right? now cache misses, instructions per cycle, are the, are the main things we, we need to care about. Because that's going to be a, a better approximation for what we think the query is actually going to do when it runs. Uh, but the tricky thing is, unlike in, 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 with the disk, the, the, our database system, because it's a user-level process, doesn't have the same kind of control over what's in our CPU caches or not as we did in our buffer pool manager, right? Because the hardware is what's managing our CPU caches. So there's a whole bunch of other things, you know, like in the case of buffer pool manager, we know whether we're doing LRU or clock or arc or whatever, and we can then use that in our cost model to estimate whether, you know, what's going to get evicted or not. But in the case of the CPU, this is sort of opaque to us, and it's left to the hardware, and the hardware can do whatever it wants. Then there's a whole bunch of other things, like dealing with shared caches, and we can't actually pin things in our CPU, in CPU caches. Um, we got to deal with And then we won't talk about this so much in this class. We'll talk, start talking about this next week. Um, but we also now need to account for uh, NUMA, or non-uniform non memory access, where we could have two sockets or, or, or four sockets. And the data that one thread might need running on one socket might be on another so socket. And then the communication of getting that data becomes more expensive. So this is all really, really tricky to do. Um, 
And when you think about it, like in case of the Intel, Intel spends millions of dollars to build these simulators before they put out a new Xeon or a new you know, iCore 7 that allows them to get a good estimation about what the performance of, the, of, the, of their chips are going to do. We essentially need to be able to replicate the same thing but put inside of our database system and also have it be really, really fast because we want to do this, you know, at, at the moment someone executes a query, we want to be able to get these estimates. So doing this low-level approximation of, the, of what the, uh, the CPU is actually do while we execute our query is super hard. And as far as I know, nobody actually does this. And instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use the, the number of tuples that we're going to process per operator as a good enough estimation of what the CPU is actually going to do. Right? So all these things... Uh, can be encapsulated in, in in this metric here. What I'll say also too is that there is uh, there are going to be some some additional optimizations we can apply that will actually matter uh, that can make a make a big difference. But we a lot of times we can make these almost at at runtime, um, you know, uh, and we we can sort of do this as as we're reading the data. We can decide that you know we maybe want to run this thread over here or that thread over there. That doesn't need to be included in, in our cost model at this point. We can just handle that as a scheduling problem later on, which we'll cover uh, next class. And again, if you're a distributed in-memory database like the MemSQL guys, you'd have to include the, the network I.O. In, in this. So as far as I can tell from reading all the manuals of the in-memory databases that are out there, at least the ones that you know, are, describe what they're doing, as far as I can tell, everyone, every, everyone does this. So I want to do one example, though, that again is, is almost exactly what he was asking before, uh, from, from small base, where they actually do, again, run these micro benchmarks to try to figure out what the hardware can actually do. So remember, small base was a research project at HP Labs. It was the, one of the first in-memory databases from the 1990s. Um, back then, these systems were sometimes called real-time databases, right? because they were meant to run in, in telco installations where you, should, you have to run a, you know, a query or a transaction at the moment someone places a call, so you need to have a really short latency like in the, in the, in the millisecond range. Um, but now we just sort of call these in-memory databases. So then HP spun off small base as a, as a startup, and that became times 10. And, and then Oracle bought times 10 in 2006. And it more or less, it's not dead, but like they don't, it's in maintenance mode. They don't really update it as far as I can tell. And um, Oracle mostly tries to sell it as a cache for the, for the uh, transactional cache for, the, for the, the, the main database server where they make all the money. But like I said, it was one of the first MME databases. So the way the small base cost model is going to work is that it's basically going to have two phases. So the first phase is back at the development uh, shop for the people actually building the database system. They're going to try to identify a bunch of uh, low-level execution primitives that the database system is going to execute when it processes a query. So don't think of these primitives as like at, at the operator level, like a hash join or, or sort merge join. Think of these as like evaluating a predicate on a single tuple or doing a lookup inside the index, right? These are all sort of the low-level things you have to do as part of executing a, a query plan or an operator. So they're going to generate a bunch of these, uh, these low-level primitives, and they're going to create these micro-benchmarks that approximate roughly what a query will do when they actually execute these primitives. So then when you boot the system up, so this is now when you actually deploy small base, when the system boots up, you'd run a bunch of these, um, these primitive uh, tests, micro benchmarks, you know, a couple million times, and try to estimate what the CPU and the memory can actually do. And then when now you compute your execution cost or operator cost in your cost model, instead of using those magic weighting functions that we saw in the Postgres uh, documentation, you use these, these, the, the results from these micro benchmarks to help you come up with more accurate estimations. So, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, it's not, this is not used at all anymore in times 10. I don't know whether this, they, they used this in the 1990s and they eventually abandoned it, but right now, as far as I can tell, times 10 is using the same approach that I said before, where you're estimating the number of tuples you process uh, uh, per operator. But again, this is a good example of doing this micro benchmark approach. All right, so if I said that the, the estimating the number of tuples processed per operator is the most important thing, uh, the question is how we're actually going to do this. And so getting this estimation is going to be based on three factors. The first is going to be what is the access method we're going to have available to us uh, for each table we need to, we need to uh, access in, a, in our query, right? Whether we're doing a sequential scan, 
uh, how the data is sorted, if it's sorted at all, how it's compressed, whether we're doing uh, index scan, what indexes are available to us. Then we have to deal with the distribution of the values in the database attributes. Um, and this again, we need to know we need to know this in order to figure out uh, how many tuples we think we're going to want to get out of this uh, in our access. And then of course it's the predicates we use in our query, right? For simple things like if we have a where clause where something equals something and it's doing a lookup on the primary key, we know it's going to return back a single tuple, uh, and that's why these simple queries are easy, easy for us to estimate. But if it's a bunch of disjunctions or a bunch of, of regular expressions or like clauses, then it becomes more problematic. Uh, and the sort of using real simple uh, heuristics to figure out the uh, the number of tuples we're going to process per operator uh, becomes more tricky and becomes more error prone. So the 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 main construct or the main uh, uh, factor we're going to to use to figure out how much data we're going to have to process is called the selectivity. And so the selectivity of an operator is essentially what percentage of the data that's being fed into it uh, will be emitted out of, out of it, right? Will we generate as the output for this thing? So typically you, you model this as a probability where the, the probability is, the, the, is based on what percentage of the tuples in the input will satisfy the predicate and therefore be emitted as the output. So if I have 10 tuples and my predicate has a selectivity uh, or one tuple will match of those 10 tuples, I would say my selectivity is 10%. Right? So 10% of the tuples will match based on my predicate and the operator will, will, will spit that out. So there's a bunch of different ways we can actually compute this, this selectivity, but this is be the main thing that's gonna, we're gonna get to use to figure out how much data we're, we're gonna have to process. So the, the first thing is that you can just rely on the domain constraints that are specified in, in the schema. Right? So if you, you know, if you have an enum, for example, you would know that it can only have the, you know, these certain values. Or if you have check clauses in, in your create table statement, you would know roughly what the range of the possible values. Um, you can rely on pre-computed statistics. So in the case of Oracle, they call these zone maps. Uh, if, you're in, if it's IBM, they call them synopsis tables. Remember I said before when we talked about compression, the zone maps were pre-computed aggregations or statistics about individual columns or blocks of, of, of data in the database. Right? So if we're given block, you can pre-compute the min, the max, the, the sum, the average, and the count for each of the different values or attributes in, 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 the, in the block. And again, you can use this as a way to say, uh, based on my predicate, am I going to find a match on the... Uh, in each block based on, based on the zone maps. Uh, you can also use histograms, which is the traditional way we teach you in the introdu introduction class. Right? You can use Equiweth histograms to say, here's the number of, of the occurrences of a particular value for, for a column. Um, you can also use approximations, which are a, or sketches as a way to, to approximate what the histogram tries to compute accurately. And then the last approach is you use sampling, where you collect some representative tuples from your tables, and then you just run the predicates over them, uh, and then you use that as to compute the, 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 the selectivity. So I'll, I'll go through uh, these last two in a bit more detail. So again, the, at a high level, what's going to happen here, in this case of, of histograms, is that you run the analyze function in SQL, and that does a sequential scan on your tables, and then based on that, you, you spit out some, some statistics to say, this is what my data looks like. Um, and obviously, you don't want to be doing this all the time. So uh, you run this every so often, and then as your, as your, as your table changes, and, and you update things, insert things, and delete things, your histograms become stale or inaccurate, and then you would run Analyze again uh, to refresh them and get more up-to-date more up statistics. So the, the way to sort of think about this, though, and is that when you execute queries, a lot of them could be sequential scans, that's essentially doing the same thing as your analyze function. So is there a possible way to piggyback the analyze operations you would normally do periodically with your query execution? And that way you don't have to you know, run, make sure you run analyze as a cron job. Can you just sort of incrementally over time refresh yourself and get, get more accurate results? So this is what IBM tried in the early 2000s with this thing called Leo or the, the learning optimizer. And again, basically what happened is you, your query would show up, and you do the parsing planning and run it through the optimizer. The optimizer uses the cost model. The cost model says, here's the estimate of the selectivity of your predicates. 
And then you would actually record that and put that into the query plan. So then when you execute the query and you're actually doing the scan on, on, on the, the base tables, you would check to see whether the estimates that you were computed in the cost model during the planning phase match up with the actual selectivity you're seeing in the, in the real table while you're scanning it. And then if you notice that you're off, you send back to the, the cost model uh, changes or uh, uh, deltas and say, here's why you were off. Or, here, here's, what I, here's what I actually saw when I actually ran the query. So this seems like an awesome idea, right? This seems like it exactly solves the problem we're going to have of having inaccurate estimations due to stale histograms. I don't know what the hell happened, uh, but apparently this never worked. Um, every DB2 DBA I've ever talked to for the last five years all tell me that every time they install DB2, they turn this thing off because it never worked and made things worse. Um, so I need to go back and maybe email Guy Lohman and figure out what actually went wrong. And why is this thing always uh, in aggregate? Because it seems like this be like a you know the right thing to do, a simple thing to do, um, but something happened and it didn't work. Um, but what I'll say though is that the way they were doing this was just based on statistics. It wasn't anything like you know using machine learning or reinforcement learning. But at a high level, it is kind of doing the same thing, right? You you make an estimate. Then you 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 do an action and you see what the uh, the actual correct result is and you can feed that back into your model and try to improve things. So this is actually something we're trying here at CMU, the group that is doing cost model stuff in for project three. They want to try this, putting like a deep net in our cost model. Um, but I also know that Microsoft is actually doing this in their system as well. I, I, the paper's not probably not published yet, but they're essentially putting a deep net in the cost model. They essentially do the same thing that, that Leo tried to do. 20 years ago. Um, so I think this, I think this, this is at a high level, this is what you want to do. I think the, I don't know what happened with the implementation. All right, so the alternative to, to histograms is to use uh, approximations. So for, for this, again, think of this as still you have to run analyze to compute these things. This is not the learning stuff that I, that I just mentioned. This is like, instead of storing accurate histograms, which can be difficult to get right and can take a lot of space, you can use what are called sketches that allow you to approximate the same information you'd get from a histogram, but with an error bound estimate, right? It's gonna be wrong, but it'll give you, it'll give you a bound to say how wrong it thinks it actually is. So again, you can do this for things like count distinct, count the number of distinct elements, uh, frequent items, what are the heavy hitters, what things are you seeing most often. So the reason why I bring this up is uh, two years ago, we had the CEO of Splice Machine uh, which is a, as a, a distributed database that's trying to do HTAP workloads. It's, it's basically HBase plus Spark mashed together to do hybrid uh, transaction processing and analytics. Um, and so the CEO is, is Monty Zwiebin. He's CMU alum, and he's actually on the board of advisors for SCS. So he came and gave a talk in the intro, introduction database class two years ago. And he talked about how in, they were having a lot of problems getting good uh, cost estimates in their cost model because they were using histograms the way everyone else does. But then when they switched over to do sketches, it turned out to be way less work to maintain these things, and they end up generating more accurate results than they did with sort of the, the, the regular histograms. And they talked about how uh, when they added this in, they could go from supporting 10 tables in a join up to like, I think, 75 or something like that. Um, so he was a big fan of this. And then we actually tried doing this in Peloton. I think it, the code is still there, but we're in the process of verifying uh, whether our approximations are actually correct. Uh, I like how uh, every time I talk about Davis companies about query optimizers, the metric they always use to say how good their optimizer is, is always how many joins, how many tables they can support in, in, to joins in, in, in their queries, right? The uh, Green Plum guys told me Orca could do 35, 35 table joins, then the Splice Machine guy told me they could do 75, then the Mem Siegler guys told me they could do 135, right? Um, I don't know how realistic that actually is. I'm sure there's queries that are doing those crazy, crazy number of joins. Um, but I think it's the wrong way to measure how good your query optimizer is, right? As we saw, as we we'll see in the, in the paper you guys read, it's not just number of tables you can join, because anybody can do that. It's whether you're actually getting uh, proper ordering. All right, so the last way to, to compute your, your selectivity is to do sampling. And the idea here is that rather than try to derive the selectivity from histograms, you take a representative subset of the data or the, of the tuples from the tables you're trying to scan on, 
run your predicate on those on this sample, and then use that to compute the selectivity, right? And of course, the number of tools you need to examine in your sample obviously depends on the on a lot of factors, especially the number of, of tuples you have in your table, right? If you have a billion tuples in your table and you take a sample of ten, that's probably going to be uh, inaccurate. So there's two ways to actually maintain uh, could, uh, to maintain your samples. The first is that you could just have this internal table that's a read-only copy of the base table that the, the query optimizer and the, the cost model can, can go against without worrying about interfering with any other query running at the same time. So every so often you'll periodically go through and you'll refresh your, your, your sample um, so that you, get, you always get more accurate estimates. And typically the way you do this is like, if my table has changed by 10%, Right, if I have 10% of the table, the, the table has been updated or deleted or inserted, then I'll just go through and, 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 re, and recompute my sample. The other approach is to actually go run the sample uh, the lookup on directly on the, on the real data. And so to do this, you basically run your, your sample query uh, under read, uh, read uncommitted, because you don't want to, you know, you don't, you don't want this to be a transaction that interferes with other queries run at the same time, right? Because you're doing this inside the cost model, inside in, in your kind of query optimizer. So it's actually not running queries, but you don't want to, you know, the cost model interfere with slow down real queries running. So the challenge with this is that you may end up reading uh, multiple versions of the same logical tool, multiple physical versions, because if you're just scanning through and you don't really care whether something's actually visible or not, within the same block, you may read, you know, multiple versions of the same same uh, logical tuple, and therefore that'll that'll screw up your estimates. Um, as far as I know, I think this is what uh, Hyper does, and this is what um, SQL Server does. And then for our system, I think we we end up implementing it this this way as well. All right. So whether we're using uh, sampling or using approximations or histograms, uh, once we have you know some data structure we can we can look against and try to compute our selectivity. Now we can generate the cardinality, which is going to give me the number of tuples that we're going to have to uh, we're going to spit out, and we compute this cardinality based on the selectivity of of our predicates multiplied by the number of tuples that are being fed in to us as, as input, right? So in the case of accessing a base table, if you're doing a sequential scan, this is just the number of tuples in total of the table times the, the selectivity of my predicate. So in the introduction class, the way we tell you how we compute cardinalities and any textbook that tells you how to compute cardinalities is always going to be based on, on three major assumptions that just we use to make these, these estimations easier. So the first assumption is that we're going to, we're going to assume that the, the, table, the data we're accessing has a uni uniform distribution of values. So if I have 100 tuples, and I'll say that every possible value can occur uh, one over 100 times, right? That, that's, that's the selectivity of it. Um, this is obviously not true because in real data, it's usually heavily skewed, right? We talked about the brown corpus when we talked about compression, right? A lot of times there'll be, you know, a small number of people who generate the most amount of data and the data will be really skewed. And so therefore, this is, this is not going to work out. So the way to actually handle this is that you can maintain a separate data structure for what are called your heavy hitters, the most frequent items, and maintain accurate estimations of their uh, cardinality for just those elements, like the, the top 10 uh, you know, values that appear the most, and then everything else can just be used as uniform data assumption. The next issue you have to deal with is that we're going to assume that our predicates are all independent, right? So that means that, again, basic probability, you would say if I have a, uh, the, the, the probability that uh, I have for this one predicate, it's one over 10 of my, two, you know, 10 percent of my tuples is going to match. This other one is 10 percent of my tuples is going to match. Then you multiply those things together, and now you say one percent of your tuples is going to match. Um, but that, as we'll see in a second, this is not always the case because a lot of times your values be correlated with each other, your attributes are correlated with each other, and therefore you can an inaccurate estimate there. And the last one is that we assume that we have the what's called the inclusion principle when we join tables, and this basically says that. Uh, for every key in your inner table, there will be a corresponding key in the outer table. Like think of like foreign keys. But a lot of times in OLAP queries, 
you're not joining tables together on foreign keys, you're joining on arbitrary uh, attributes, and therefore this thing does, doesn't always apply. So to show you how the first two assumptions here uh, can screw you up, there's another, there's this example I like to use again from, from Guy Lohman, um, where he has this sample database of automobiles, and for a really simple table you say that you have the table of cars, and you have the number of, of different makes you have of the cars is 10, right? So this is like Ford, Toyota, um, Tesla. And then the number of models in your, in, your, in your table is 100. So this would be like Corolla, Camry, Accord, right? So if you have a really simple query like this, where make equals Honda and model equals Accord, if you make the independent and uniformity assumptions from the last slide, the, the, the cost model will compute the selectivity as 1 over 10 times 1 over 100, which is you know, 0.001. But we know, as humans, we know that these values are actually correlated because we know that only Honda can make the accord. So the true selectivity is, is 1 over 100 for this. And you see from this, this is what the, the independence assumption will give us and the uniformity assumption gives us. Uh, we're order magnitude off here, right? So if we make this assumption, we're going to assume we're going to we're going we're to compute a selectivity that will generate uh, an order magnitude fewer tuples than what we'll get in the, in the real system. And you're gonna, you guys saw this in the paper you read. All the cost models for all the different uh, database systems are, are underestimating the amount of data they're generating, and that's because because of these things here. So one way to solve this is to tell the data system that some, some columns are correlated, and they can use that when it computes the selectivity to treat them as a, gr as a group rather than computing them individually, and this can help you get more accurate estimations and so you don't underestimate things as, as much. So as far as I know, this is only supported in the commercial systems. This first appeared in uh, DB2, um, and I think both Microsoft and Oracle have this now. Um, but as far as I know, this is a manual process. So, the, so the, the DBA has to come in and say, oh, my last example, make and model are correlated with each other. So don't treat them as independent predicates. Treat them as a single group. Because right? otherwise, if you think about this, if you had to do this automatically, it's an exponential problem because now you need to scan every column and compare with every other column. And that can be really, really slow in a large database. So this helps. But this is, this is a manual thing. The, the, the human has to tell us uh, this information. So to give you an idea of how things can go wrong, um, I'm going to use a really simple example where getting bad estimations can, can foul us up. And you'll see how these things amplify as, as you go up. So we have a really simple query here. We join ABC. Um, and we're going to join A and B on their IDs, and A and ID, A ID and C ID together. And then we'll have a single uh, uh, greater than predicate on the, uh, the BID. And for this, this plan here, it doesn't matter whether it's a logical plan or physical plan. We don't care about that. We don't care whether it's a hash join or server join. Again, we're just, we're just talking about selectivities here. So at, at the base table, at, at, the, at the bottom of the, the query plan, uh, we need to compute the cardinality of accessing the, these base tables. So in the case of A and C, since there are no predicates uh, on their attributes other than the, the join clauses, um, we just say that their selectivity is, is, is 100%, right? the total number of tuples that, that they have. Um, in the case of, of BID, it's, it's this predicate here. So this is going to be, again, the, the number of tuples in my, in my table multiplied by the selectivity of, of this predicate here. So again, we can use our statistics in our catalogs to be able to compute this. So then now we start computing the cardinality of the join results. For the first join on A and B, uh, we take the cardinalities of A and B multiplied together, and we divide this by the max of either the selectivity of the join clause of A.ID a, a with B.ID or the uh, greater than a predicate on, on B.ID. And then now, as we go feed this, 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 this estimation from this operator up into this operator, now we see we're including this math here down into our estimation for doing the three-way join of, of, of A, B joined with C. And so the thing to point out here is that if this thing gets, is wrong, right, or actually even for that, if our estimation here of the selectivity of this predicate here is wrong, then this gets wrong, 
And then this gets even more wrong when you feed into this. So these, these problems start off super simple. Uh, you know, you're just a little bit off. But then a little bit off goes up to the next guy, and he's a little bit off, but he's a little bit off from being a little bit off of before. So that sort of gets amplified. And going up and up and up, as you add more tables, uh, things get worse and worse. Again, this, we'll see this in the case of the, from the joint ordering benchmark from the hyper guys. So this is showing you that the selectivity down below will, if you're wrong here, then you get really wrong as you go up. Right, things don't get better, things get worse. Right, so uh, this is exactly what I, what I said here, right? Um, so in this paper I had you guys read, uh, it doesn't describe to you how to actually build a cost model. Um, as, as I said, it's most, most for in-memory databases, it's going to be based on the, the number of tuples that each operator is going to process. Um, but the reason why I had you guys read this paper, because it again, it's, it's a scientific evaluation or scientific measurement of showing you what happens or how wrong these, these, these cost model estimates can actually get. And so this is from the hyper guys. And what they did was they developed a, uh, generate a new benchmark called the joint ordering benchmark or, or job. And what they're going to do is going to load in uh, some tables to the database that are skewed based on some real world distribution. And they're going to generate different, uh, different queries with different join orderings. And they're going to measure the, the difference between what the cost model estimates as the, as the number of tuples or the selectivity of each operator versus what the actual real data looks like. Right? So the ways of the work is again, they'll, they'll, they'll load the data, database in for each, each of these systems, then they'll run analyze that, that, you know, so the system can go and look over all the data and compute all the, you know, the best statistics that, it, that it, it can compute. And then they run their queries and then they, they, instrument, get out, they instrument the systems to get out the query plans and look at what the cost model is actually estimating for each of the join operators. So this is entirely a read-only workload. Like this is the best case scenario for these systems. Right? You load a static database, you run analyze, then you run your experiments. So it's, they don't have to deal with doing inserts, updates, and deletes. That could be modifying or, or changing the base tables. Right? It's really, you know, if, what's the best these systems that actually can do if they have all the information ahead of time? So there's two sets of graphs I want to show you. So this first one here is the measuring the, again, the estimator quality for five different database systems as you increase the, the number of joins. So along the x-axis here, so each of these boxes represent a different database system, and then the x-axis is saying the number of joins that are, that are, that are, that are happening in the, in, the, in the query. So you're going basically going from zero to seven tables you're accessing. And so the, this middle line here represents the, uh, the, when the, the, the error is, is zero. So if you're above this, then you're overestimating the, the, the selectivity, so you're thinking more tuples are going to coming out than they actually do. But then if you're below this, then you're underestimating the uh, selectivity, so you're saying fewer tuples actually come out than you actually think, think, think to come out, right? So the, the major trend across all these systems is that you see that as you add more tables, as you do more joins, things just die, things just get worse, right? So again, this is what I said before. I, I, we don't know whether the, uh, the commercial systems are making the independence assumption, the uniform data assumption. I suspect that they're not uh, for everything, but this is representative of what you would see if you, if you, if you had these problems where things just get worse uh, as you add more tables. So the first thing to point out is this guy here. Uh, this one actually does the best. Uh, that you see around up until uh, there's about four tables here. So it's doing okay up to three tables, and then around four tables, it gets, it gets worse. But of, of all, all the different systems, it actually does the best. Um, its bounds are a little bit larger than this one, um, but they're, they're closest to that middle point uh, compared to everyone else. So it's just doing reasonably well. Uh, these three here, uh, these all almost look exactly the same, right? They're all sort of trending down at the same level. In this case here, the, the bounds are a bit tighter. Whereas this one, they're a bit wider. Um, but what's that, sorry? Those are commercial databases, right? The middle three. Yeah, uh, well, we'll get there. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, so, so again, these look roughly the same. And then this one here is the worst one, right? As you see, after uh, just, was it, three tables, it, it just completely falls apart. Uh, and its, it's, its estimations are way off, right? All right, question, yes. Uh, so since these 
error around seems very systematic. Why can't you just correct for it uh, after a certain amount? So his, his statement is, since these, uh, these errors look to seem almost like uh, programmatic, meaning like they occur exactly the same, you know, the same rate, the same way, can you just put a little fudge factor into your cost model so that you shoot it up? Um, yes, you could do that. And this is essentially what we want to try to do with, with, a, with a deep net in there. Um, I don't know why they don't do that. Right? This is what, again, this is what Leo is supposed to solve. They're like, oh, I'm wrong. Let me try to get myself back up. But it doesn't work. Yes? Didn't the paper seem to imply that if you're kind of uniformly estimating badly, like at that, at a, at that certain number of joins, that you're probably still going to end up estimate, like selecting a query that's okay-ish? Like, because you're, you're estimating all of them uniformly. So, so his statement is that if you're always estimating uniformly badly, does that mean that uh, you will you'll choose the best plan even though it's the estimation is wrong, but relative to all the other plans, it's still doing okay. Yeah, they all have the same bias, basically. Right, they all have the same bias. So the issue with that, and we'll see this in the next slide, is that if you use these estimations to pre-allocate things, like hash table sizes, then you're going to have to do, you know, you're going to realize, oh, I don't have enough space or buffer sizes. I got to re resize my, my, my stuff. And that's become, that becomes problematic. So his statement is, this is highly depends on the benchmark. In TPCH, there wasn't a really big difference. TPCH has zero skew, right? So that's why it always, it, these guys work out just fine. All right, so uh, there was murmurs about, they were trying to figure out which system was which, right? So the paper tells you the first one and the last one, right? The first one was Postgres, the last one was uh, Hyper. So let me take a guess what these middle three are. The bad one is Oracle. He, said, he says the bad one. All right, raise your hand. If, all right, let's start the, the worst one here. Raise your hand if you think it's Oracle. All right, so what's, who thinks it's IBM? Microsoft? Any other system? What, you think, you think it's another system? What, what system do you think it is? You, you, so he, his statement is, a commercial system can't be that bad. Yeah. Okay, so this is the best one. Who th what, what, do, what do you guys think this is? Microsoft. Microsoft, right, okay. <laughs> You're right. SQL Server, Oracle, <laughs> DB2. All right. Um, SQL Server is really good. I say this every year. I say this all the time. SQL Server is, uh, I consider to be a, uh, the leading commercial system. I think it's the most state of the art. Uh, it does some really interesting things. Um, and so they actually use cascades. They also do sampling the way that the hyper guys do. Um, and I think, I think the, the quality of, of what, what their code really shows here. Um, it's very impressive. <laughs> Leave it at that. OK. <laughs> All right. So the, the next experiment is going to show you the improvement that you can get when you have the correct estimates. So what they did was they took Postgres 9.4, and then they added hooks in the cost model so that when the system would go get to like its, its catalogs to get its statistics to do an estimate of the selectivity of our predicate, they would inter intercept that and then inject in the actual, the real cost estimates. And they ran their benchmark uh, of all the queries running with real estimates, and they want to compare what the default query plan or the cost model can do versus when, what happens when you have the, the real estimates. So the way to read this graph is that it's the percentage of the queries uh, in their benchmark grouped by how far off they are from the, when you run the query with the exact estimation. So like in this box here, so this is saying that 60% of the queries are 1.1x to over 100x times slower than what the queries would do when you actually have the totally accurate estimations. So what's going on here is that the, the, because we're underestimating the size of our, the, the, the amount of data that operators are going to spit out, Postgres is optimizer and saying, well, it's, it doesn't look like you're, you're, you're going to have to process much data. Let me use a nested loop join instead of a hash join. Right? Now, in the intro class, we always say the hash join is always faster than the nested loop join from a pure al algorithmic standpoint. Right? But there's all this sort of 
a setup you have to do uh, when you want to do a hash join that we don't really cover, like allocating a bunch of space to build a hash table, then hashing your data and putting it into the hash table, right? And then as a loop join, you don't do that. You just do your loops and, and spit data out. So what's happening here is that uh, the, we're underestimating the amount of data we have to read on operators, and then it's falling back to use, using nested loop joins. So what they did was, then you pass in the flag into Postgres, and you tell it to not use nested loop joins at all, and now you see that a, a bunch of the, the costs are now shifting closer to uh, being 100% accurate. So the way to think about this is like, the closer you are to this way, on this side of the graph, the more uh, your queries are performing at the same speed as they would when you have um, uh, the true cardinality. So now the question is, what's going on with these other guys here where we're, we're still running slower, even though we're, we're using hash joins the way we should? And so the issue is that in the case of Postgres 9.4, uh, they didn't support dynamic or incremental uh, resizing of the hash table. So again, we're underestimating the, the amount of data our operator is going to spit out. So then it says, all right, I'm gonna, I, need to spit, I need to handle 100 tuples, so I'm going to allocate a hash table that can support 100 tuples. And then when you're way off and you start inserting more than 100 tuples, now you start to have collisions in your hash table, and you have these long chains, so now every single time you have to do a lookup or probe in the hash table to do your join, you're following along and read sequentially these long, these long bucket lists. So they fixed this in Postgres 9.5, where they add a support for incremental hash, hash table resizing. And so what they did was they backported that feature from 9.5 into 9.4, and then now you see that when you have, uh, uh, when you force it not to use hash joins, or sorry, force it not to use nested loop joins, and you support dynamic resizing, you know, a large percentage of your queries are now matching up um, with what you would get when you're 100% when you're accurate. So this is showing you the, 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 the degradation of performance that you get uh, from the last slide where I showed you how off their estimates are. This is showing when you actually look at runtime performance, how that affects, affects you. And again, it's not just the choosing bad plans, it's also choosing the bad data structures and other sort of runtime selections that you have to make in your query plan. All right, so this is a summary of uh, some, uh, some high level uh, uh, findings or conclusions that the Germans got Germans made uh, after this paper. So this was sent to me by Victor, Victor Lees when we were talking about this paper uh, a while ago. And so these are the, 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 the four things that the main takeaways of all this. So the first thing is he points out is that uh, query optimization is also often more important than getting a good query optimizer is also more important than having a really fast execution engine. So you have the most fastest execution engine in the world, but if you're always picking crappy plans, then it doesn't matter how great your system is, right? And the example he brought up was, was TPCH, how so saying like TPCH, the numbers look fine. It's because TPCH doesn't actually look like a lot of things in the real world because it's, it assumes uniform distribution. But real data is heavily skewed, and so therefore making sure you, do, you choose the correct orderings of things can matter a lot. The cardinality estimates are routinely wrong. We saw that in, in the graphs. Um, and so ideally it would be nice if you, can, if you can have operators in your, in your database system that don't actually rely on having super accurate esti estimates, because your estimates are going to en 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 essentially be wrong. So the hash table or the hash join in Postgres is a good example of this. So in 9.4 and prior versions, it relied on having accurate estimations on the, the output or the amount of data it was going to have to process. And if you got that wrong, performance fell apart. So if you can have uh, these operators sort of be self-managing and incrementally adapt itself, if it recognizes that the, the data doesn't look like what it thought it was going to look like, then you should be able to handle this more smoothly. They also make the argument that uh, in the case of OLAP queries, just having a good hash join implementation and doing fast scans might actually be good, is, is actually probably good enough or better than doing anything more sophisticated. So even if you have indexes, it may be better just to blaze through it, par uh, do a parallel scan on your, on your table you know, with vectorized uh, predicate evaluation, which we'll talk about in, in a few, few more lectures. Um, that's actually doing the, the combination of these two, doing this efficiently, may actually be better than using indexes. And then the last one is that trying to work with a work, work on and generate a really accurate co cost model, like 
the thing I talked about in small base where you're doing those micro benchmarks, that actually does not actually help you. You're better off making sure your estimations are more accurate because getting the joint ordering is what matters the most. Right? It doesn't matter that you, you, you compute at a fine grain the CPU cost of doing an index scan versus a sequential scan. If your joint ordering is crappy, then you, the whole query plan is going to fall apart. Right? So the way to think about this is, this is the high pole in the tent that's going to be the, the thing we need to worry about the most. And super fine grain or super accurate CPU estimations are, are, are not something we should concern about. All right, so what are my parting thoughts about all this? So the, as I said, the computing the number of tuples processed uh, in our operators and our query plan is a reasonable cost model for in-memory databases. Because again, it encapsulates all the various things that could be going on in the system. Um, but as we saw, getting your selectivity estimations and cardinality estimations correct is actually a difficult thing to do. Um, and I think it's a combination of doing sampling and sketching, possibly also with deep nets as a, as a feedback loop, is, is the right way to achieve accurate estimations. And again, this is independent of whether you're using Cascades, Volcano, the stratified search, Starburst, doesn't matter, right? You need this in order to make the other thing uh, work well. All right, any questions about optimization or, or cost models? All right, you're all dying to go build your own cost model, right? All right, so I now want to talk about, again, the, some high-level things you should think about as you get started uh, working on your project um, in the back of your mind as a way to help you navigate the code and understand what's going on. So. As a disclaimer for this, I will say that I'm actually, you know, I'm not perfect or whatever, you know, as much as I read the reviews and, and the students write that I'm godlike, I'm not. Uh, so uh, I would say that, like, you know, I've, I've worked on two different database systems in my life. I've spent some time in Postgres. Uh, I helped build a distributed, or, or was working on a distributed system or batch processing system uh, before I started grad school. So I have spent some time uh, reading code. And working on code, uh, I've done uh, some legal work where they give you some a bunch of, of a source code dump, and you're required to sit down in a room and try to figure out what the thing actually is doing to help you know somebody testify and say whether they violated a patent or not. Um, which I can talk about that stuff later. That's that's actually always really fun. Um, and so I you 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 call this enterprise code. Enterprise code is just as bad as research code. So don't don't let people fool you to say research code is is total crap. Um, so I'm not claiming that I know how to do everything uh, uh, you know, for software engineering, how you, how you get started on a complex code base, but I've done it enough where I can talk about the things that helped me and use them as a way to, to, to help guide you guys. So the first thing I'll, I'll say is a major observation is that you know, not, not only is it true in this class, but it can be true the rest of your, your, your career if you stay in software development or computer science, is that it's almost never the case that you're going to be working on a project from scratch, right? It almost, it's 2018. Nobody writes standard.io.h from scratch, right? You're use, everyone is using existing code. That's how we can get things uh, done much more quickly. So you should be expected that throughout your career that you're going to have to sit down at a desk or a terminal and start looking at code that you didn't write. And as I said, the person might be dead, the person might, 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 might have hygiene problems, so you don't want to go talk to them. So you don't have a way to go talk to the person who actually wrote that code, so you need to figure out on your own uh, how you actually handle this. And I will say that in talking with my friends at, at various database companies and startups, the, the number one skill that they always tell me that they want for new hires is that they're looking for people that can sit down and work independently and efficiently on these existing code bases. Right? So when I first you started planning to teach this course a few years ago. I asked all the different database companies. I said, hey, I'm teaching an you know, advanced PhD level course on database internals. What skills do you want me to teach the students? Like, what's the one thing you want new students to be able to know? Right? Do you want them to know indexes? you want to know locking, latching, concurrent control? What do you guys want? And without me prompting them, they all basically said the same thing. And I didn't tell them what the other company said. They all told me that they want, they want people that can work on large code bases. Right? Because it's really hard to do. So what not to do to get started on this is what I'll call passive reading, right? Uh, if you're going to sit down and read code for the sake of reading code, you're going to have a bad time. Uh, 
this often happens when I have students, they say they want to get started on the project, and I, we give them a small task, you know, help them get, get their feet wet in the system. And then when I go check on them a few days later, their response is, oh, I haven't started writing any code, I've just been reading the code, right? That's always a bad sign for me, and it tells me the student's actually not going to work out, because if you're just reading the code, trying to just understand it without any purpose, you're not going to internalize everything, you're not going to absorb what you're actually reading, and it's not going to make any sense, right? So the, the best thing you can do to actually get started is actually try to do, you know, do something in it. We can talk about what, what, what that doing actually could be. But that's the right way to get started in doing this. If you just sit down and say, I'm going to read this file and this function, yada, 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 it's, it's never going to happen. Right? Um, and I've known this because you know, I've, I've done work uh, in, in, in various systems. And personally, I find that if I just read it for the sake of reading it, it takes way longer for you, you to get started on anything. So what are the things you can actually start doing? Well, the first thing you can do is to start writing test cases, right? And just adding new test cases or improving test cases, uh, because this is going to force you to understand what the code is actually doing uh, in order to make your test case actually perform the thing you want to perform. Um, and again, this is you sort of building a mental model what the, what's actually going on and can help you uh, figure things out much more quickly. So for these kind of test cases, this would have to be unit tests, not regression tests. In the context of a database system, right, if you just write test cases that write SQL and through JDBC and get back a response, as much as I love that, uh, it, it doesn't require you to actually go into the system and see actually what's going on. Right? You're not calling individual components. So writing low-level unit tests is the way to get start, started doing this. And we, in the case of our system, we have G-Test. We have the C++ test, test code. When you call make check, this is what gets fired off. Um, Nobody will complain that you wrote test cases, right? Unless you write bad test cases, right? Just one equal one, right? Like, if, if you have something substantial, no one will ever say, you know, you spent your first week writing test cases, how dare you, right? This is, helps you understand the code and helps make, make the, the system more, uh, more, more reliable. The next thing you can do is refactoring. Uh, so this is basically, you know, look at a bunch of code, you think it's kind of crappy, you think there's a better way to do it. Um, you're not changing the high-level functionality, you're just reorganizing uh, what calls what. So a good example of this would be if you have a giant function that should be sort of uh, modularized, uh, you could do that, break it out into different pieces. Other things you can do is go add comments or update comments that, are, that may be out of date. And then if you have really ugly code that's difficult to read, you, go, you can go clean that up. Um, the one danger of this, of course, is that since you're new to the system and you don't fully understand what's going on, uh, you don't want to make too many dramatic changes because you may not understand some of the assumptions that other parts of the system are making about uh, the code you're modifying, and you don't want to end up break, breaking a bunch of things. So hopefully there's test cases to know whether you, you've broken something. Um, but maybe to get started, you may not want to be making uh, dramatic changes because you know, you're not completely entirely familiar with everything. All right, so then the last thing you can do is uh, actually go through the full uh, process of actually building the software. So at, all the different companies have different ways that they, they manage the source code, they manage their build processes, uh, and so you should try to figure out and learn, learn that as soon as possible as well. Right? Google is famous for having uh, you know, one giant source code repository that everyone uh, builds upon, off of. They have their own version of Make. They have their own uh, build and test system. So. By going through this process, it'll, it'll get you to understand how the different parts move, uh, fit together and can help you then be more, more agile in making changes and testing it and making sure everything works. Right? So if there's documentation for tells you how to do this, go ahead and just follow that. Or that documentation doesn't exist, then again, no one will complain that you actually come in and, and write it. Even if they didn't hire you to write documentation, if your first week is writing documentation to help you understand uh, what's going on, then you, you know, you'll you'll make friends very quickly. All right, so any questions about any of this? Again, passive reading of source code is, 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 uh, is often be fruitless and is not the best way to get started. I think writing test cases is, is always the best way to go, or refactoring. Um, and then this one here is sort of ancillary. You should, you should do that anyway. All right, so why am I bringing, bringing this up to you guys now? Well, we have some deadlines coming up for Project 3. So on uh, Wednesday, April 11th, uh, we're not going to have class. Instead, uh, there'll be a sign-up sheet. You come meet me in my office during, during the day. And then it has to be all your team members. And you come and tell me what you guys are working on, what problems you're facing, and what do you need help with, and, and what's the overall status of the project. Right? 
And then on the following Monday, after these status meetings, we'll have the uh, status update presentations in class, just like the proposal. Everybody gets five minutes. Gus will go first, because he got cut last time. Uh, and again, you tell everyone else what's going on in your, in your code. So hopefully, as I said in the beginning, uh, when we did the proposals, you saw that a bunch of, bunch of you guys need different need a lot of the same features. There was a bunch of people that needed lock tables or table locks. So you guys should be coordinating now, making sure that someone is actually writing this code and you guys can reuse it from each other and send patches to each other. And that way you don't show up on this presentation day and come and say, oh, we wrote the uh, you know, table locks. And someone else comes and says, we wrote table locks too, right? Um, and then you also need to submit your first code review. So you had to submit your PR uh, on GitHub to uh, another group to do the code review uh, on Wednesday, April 11th. And so on the sign-up sheet, I'll pair you up with, with another group. You submit your PR to them, they submit their PR to you, and you guys have a week to do a code review and then write feedback to each other. And then you as the group should, should take that feedback as, into consideration and use that to help you update your code. And then there'll be another, PR, another uh, uh, code review at the, later on at the end of the, um, in the semester as we get closer to the deadline. Right, so the first time I taught this course, we did the code reviews at the very end, uh, and it was like super rushed, and everyone was like, oh, I really wish you, you, we did this earlier. So this is a good way to get a checkpoint in your code um, and get feedback sooner rather than later. All right, any questions about any of this? Again, I will, uh, I'll send uh, notices on Piazza uh, to help schedule things and, as, as we get closer. All right, so that's it for uh, query execution, or sorry, uh, query optimization. And now we're going down lower into the stack. Now we have an optimized query plan, presumably. Uh, now we need to execute it and schedule it. So that's the next thing we're talking about. And for, the, for, for most of the remainder of the semester, now we're actually going to talk about how we take that query plan and actually execute it efficiently. And this will begin, this will all in the context of a, of a system doing query compilation. Any questions? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith & Wesson One court and my thoughts hip-hop related Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker Rhymes I create, rotate at a way too quick To duplicate, fill a breeze, as a skate Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight When I'm in flight, then we ignite Blood starts to boil, I heat up the party for you let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Wreck still turns with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off with St. Ives